Chapter 11, Helter Skelter. When I get to the bottom, I go back up to the top of the slide. Where I stop, I turn, I go for a ride. Till I get to the bottom, I see you again. Don't you, don't you want me to love you? I'm coming down fast, but I'm miles above you. Tell me, tell me, tell me, come on, tell me the answer. You may be a lover, but you ain't no dancer. Helter Skelter, Helter Skelter. Will you, won't you, make me want you? I'm coming down fast, but don't let me break you. Tell me, tell me, tell me the answer. You may be the lover, but you ain't no dancer. Look out, Helter Skelter. Look out, cause here she comes. When I get to the bottom, I go back to the top of the slide. And I stop, I turn, and I go for a ride. I get to the bottom, and I see you again. Well, do you, don't you want me to make you? I'm coming down fast, but don't let me break you. Tell me, tell me, tell me the answer. You may be a lover, but you ain't no dancer. Look out, Helter Skelter. Look out, Helter Skelter. She's coming down fast. Yes, she is. Helter Skelter, Lennon McCartney, The Beatles, 1968. Charlie obtained The Beatles' so-called White Album in late 1968. It had a tremendous impact on our lives, especially Charlie's. One night, when many of us were playing records and listening to the album, Charlie said, They're speaking to me. He was convinced that he had some sort of apocalyptic connection with the Beatles. I never fully understood it, but I knew Charlie, our unchallenged leader, was deeply affected. And I and most of the others believed that, in some way, Helter Skelter, the end of the world, was coming down fast. But, as always, our pattern was inconsistent. We were running Helter Skelter ourselves. For example, during this time, we struck up a relationship with Dennis Wilson of the famous Beach Boys. I was never sure how Charlie got to know him. It undoubtedly had something to do with Charlie's own musical aspirations, plus our constant need for money. But at any rate, we spent a lot of time at Dennis's house on Sunset Boulevard. Large numbers of us lived there for irregular but sometimes lengthy periods. At one time, nearly a dozen of us stayed there and, at Dennis's expense, had thousands of dollars worth of dental work done. Because of heavy drug use and neglect, our teeth were in constant disrepair. I was never sure whether Dennis tolerated us because he liked us or Charlie because he feared us. But through him and others, we were often in contact with well-known, respected people within the Los Angeles, Hollywood, Beverly Hills community. We were great at crashing parties. Charlie was preaching constantly about the end of the world and the need to flee into the country, specifically into the desert. We have to find a place to live, he said, and he was convinced that the desert was the place. None of us disagreed. We felt an intense pressure mounting on us, a pressure from society, especially the police. We were a strange gang, and the police watched us constantly. They knew Charlie was on parole, as were several others. They also knew, but had trouble proving, that we were heavy into dope, both using and, before long, dealing. They followed our bus frequently. The least little safety violation of burned-out light, for instance, brought them down on us. Large numbers of runaway kids were also showing up at spawns, looking for a place to stay or hide out. They were from all over the country, New England, the South, the Southwest, and up and down the West Coast. We felt an intense pressure to help them lie low until the heat was off. But most deeply, we felt that society was destroying itself, but that we were immune because we were in the thought. The early Christians had referred to themselves as being in the way. We were in the thought. We were tuned into God, at least Charlie was, and the rest of us through him. And we believed we had to fight to survive. We have to survive above all things, Charlie said, over and over. 
We thus made many trips to the desert, taking the bus as far as it would go, and walking even farther. We explored places all over Death Valley. I had not known an area as desolate or impenetrable before. We had to have a way to travel. Then we came upon the idea of dune buggies. They were to be our solution. We had a place in the desert to go finally. One of the girls, Kathy, was the granddaughter of a woman who owned a place deep in the desert, Myers Ranch. Not too far away, less than half a mile, was another place we believed we could move into, Barker Ranch. But we needed transportation. Dune buggies. We launched an all-out program to get them. This led us into serious crime, which became like quicksand. We dealt dope actively to get money for the dune buggies. Tex, during this time, became one of our main dealers. We agreed on a plan to build buggies using Volkswagen bodies, but engines and parts from other vehicles. This meant stealing cars, which we entered into on a fairly modest scale. The parts we didn't use, a whole chassis, for example, were buried out back at the ranch. We were very expert, and many of the men who had joined us either or hung around a lot were excellent mechanics. As our desperation mounted, we began using shifts and working around the clock on the buggies. The rest of the world didn't understand, but we were serious. My loyalty to Charlie continued through all this, and probably heightened, although there were moments when I wanted to leave. In fact, I did leave several times, staying with some hippie friends in the canyon or others in L.A., but I always returned. Several of the other people did the same thing, but most of us, at least the core group, came back. We were hooked, even on the hysteria. Since the birth of my baby, Charlie had an additional grip on me to go along with my addiction to his internal power, which I thought was from God. If I got out of line, Charlie would subtly maneuver me to the children and go to work on me about their security and future. He frequently became cruel, manifest most horribly when he would take my baby by the feet and swing him around and around high over his head then down to within an inch of the rocky ground he was crazy at those moments but a split second later he would seem to be full of love for the children which he continued to think of as gods or kings Despite this control over me, Charlie kept criticizing me for being too independent and disobedient. He played me like a yo-yo, first hugging and praising me, then demeaning me in some way. One night in the desert, we were walking some distance away from the others. He was dressed in a black cape and was rather subdued, moody. He abruptly swung the cape around him and turned to me. Sadie he said softly, evilly. The trouble with you is you don't fear me enough. He was wrong. I feared him deeply. But I was at the same time thoroughly committed to him and desired probably more than anything in the world to please him. My desire for his attention was an obsession. I was constantly torn up with the thought that he didn't like me very much, which he kept churning up within me by reminding me that I didn't like myself enough. The ugliest turn in our course to that point came when Charlie thought he had killed a black man. This sent a fresh wave of paranoia that gave us a vision of all-out war between blacks and whites that was to usher in Helter Skelter, the end. Few of us knew any details, but we were told that Tex had been burned by a black man in a dope deal. The black man, Bernard Lotsapapa Crow, was said to have cheated Tex. I frankly assumed that Tex had ripped off the dope, but regardless, Charlie ended up going to Crow and ultimately shooting him, leaving him for dead. 
In fact, Crow was severely injured, with a bullet lodged next to his spine, and was on the hospital critical list for 18 days. Meanwhile, Charlie thought Crow was a Black Panther and was dead. He was terrified, figuring that the Panthers would come after us. To begin with, Charlie hated Blacks, and this only intensified his fear. He often said that all the black man wanted was to get the little white girls, while he, Charlie, wanted to keep the race pure. I believe most of the analysts of the Manson family and its crimes failed to appreciate the impact the shooting of the black man had on future events. Vincent Bugliosi, the deputy district attorney who later prosecuted several of us, in my view, gave Charlie more credit for criminal intelligence than he deserved. Bugliosi seemed convinced that Charlie was leading some Grandois' plant against the world when, from where I was, Charlie was merely reacting, for the most part, to a situation that flew out of control. Initially, he was reacting to the supposed killing of the black man. He already felt a black-white Armageddon was coming, and then feared that crow cases might trigger it. Charlie was not, in my opinion, trying to initiate the black-white showdown, but was merely reacting to it. To us, Helter Skelter was real. To the Beatles, their song was a takeoff on the use of a slippery slide in a children's park, to which they added some suggestive, primarily sexual connotations. To us, it meant things were going out of control in the world, and the end was coming. But we were reacting to it. It was running parallel to our crazy circumstances. We were not starting it. We knew we had to survive it, out in the desert, for example, where Charlie believed there was a bottomless pit in which we could escape the apocalypse and perhaps return to show the way to a new world. This was all very fuzzy, very tentative, very mixed up. But I am convinced that none of us believed Helter Skelter was something we were going to direct. I, for one, was somehow aware in my subconscious that things had slipped out of control with us, but I did nothing about it. The feeling broke over me when Charlie called us together one day. You all know that they're after us. The cops, the niggers, the establishment. They're all after us, and they'll be cracking down harder and harder. Everyone was grim-faced as we watched him. I'm going to start carrying a knife. Each of you might want to get one. This was always his way. A hint, a suggestion, never a direct order to do something. This buck knife here, that's a good one. We watched him hold it aloft. It's not too big, but it can do the job. You might get yourself one and get it sharp. Keep it with you. We'll probably be getting some guns, too. We'll have to learn how to handle them. And another thing, he said, taking a few steps across the floor. We ought to establish a guard here. We need to put guards on top of our buildings 24 hours a day. We can't afford to let them sneak in on us when we're not expecting it. I shook my head. What is this? I thought. 24 hours a day guards, 24 hour a day shifts on the buggies, knives, guns, but that wasn't all. We needed more money, so we started stealing more. We stole credit cards, especially gasoline company credit cards, to meet our soaring need for gasoline and the mechanical parts for the dune buggies. I went creepy crawling with Linda into homes and garages, an expression that came from me as we practiced and mastered silent entry into places, armed with our knives, and moved about the occupied houses without being detected.
Barefoot, in old, dark clothes, deadly earnest, we became expert in burglarizing, right under the noses of the occupants. The fear and thrill were exhilarating. I had always liked danger, although it kept me close to hysteria and panic. Furthermore, I felt we were perfectly justified in what we were doing. We were in the thought, in the now, free from thought, escaping from a doomed society. Darting in and about the dark recesses of my mind was a thought that I had trouble articulating, however. It flitted in between thoughts of knives, creepy crawling, and stealing. It was a genuine awareness that something was happening to the ingredient we had once talked about so much. Love. What's happening to our love for one another and for other people? I thought one night in one of my more lucid moments, which were less and less frequent. I felt a similar concern in a number of the other girls, but none of us put our thoughts together. Our thinking had turned to something like this. We have real love, the kind Charlie talks about, and we have to protect this precious love. We have to protect it from the policemen. They are our arch enemies. Society is blind to the fact that it is under the control of those same enemies. Society is in fact one big prison yard, and the policemen are the guards. The policemen are getting worse. We have to retaliate. We have to attack before we are attacked. We need money to do this, but the money is ours. Everything in the world is ours. The homes, the cards, the credit cards. People only think these things are theirs. But nothing is real. The Beatles' White Album, which it must be understood we were being immersed in, along with consuming unimaginable quantities of drugs, had a song that summed up much of our thinking. It was entitled Piggies and seemed to liken the straight people to the world to pigs. It spoke of little piggies crawling in the dirt and bigger piggies in starched white shirts stirring up the dirt. It criticized the unconcern of all the piggies about what was going on around them and said they needed a damn good whacking. The final verse told of the piggies and their piggy wives out for dinner, clutching forks and knives to eat their bacon. We had a friend over in Topanga Canyon, on Old Topanga Canyon Road, who had been kind to us in the last year. He had helped Mary with food and other things for her baby. His name was Gary Hinman. He was in his early thirties, big, husky, six foot two, with thinning, short cropped hair, and a very gentle spirit, a kind man who practiced transcendental meditation. A music teacher, he was a homosexual who was attracted to Charlie and Bobby. <clears throat> One afternoon, Charlie came up to me as I was perched on a huge rock on the street near the movie set saloon. No one else was within earshot. Sadie, he said, you're not a frontline person. You're a behind the scenes person. Why are you always trying to get in the living room? You belong in the kitchen. He paused. If you want to do something important, why don't you kill Gary and get his money? His eyes stared hard into my face. The tension between us was palpable, but within me I could hear the words. I'll show him. I'll show him I can be just as tough as he can. The discussion ended abruptly for the moment, but two nights later, Charlie told three or four of us that the need for money was great. I wasn't sure exactly what the money was needed for, except for dune buggies, but Charlie told us that Gary had inherited $21,000. I want you guys to go get it from him. He spoke directly to Bobby. Mary and me. He'll give it to you, I'm sure, but I want you to get it. 
His earlier words drove into my chest. Why don't you kill Gary? My body was frozen. I knew I wasn't rational. I'll show him, I had said. I was out of control. I was a scared young woman, but somehow I sensed Charlie was just a scared little man. Sexy Sadie, what have you done? You made a fool of everyone. You laid it down for all to see. Oh, sexy Sadie, you broke the rules. One sunny day, the world was waiting for a lover. She came along to turn on everyone. Sexy Sadie, the greatest of them all. Sexy Sadie, how did you know? The world was just waiting for you. Sexy Sadie, you'll get yours yet, however big you think you are. Sexy Sadie, oh, you'll get yours yet. We gave her everything we owned just to sit at her table. Just a smile would lighten everything. Sexy Sadie, she's the latest and the greatest of them all. She made a fool of everyone. Sexy Sadie, however big you think you are. Sexy Sadie. Sexy Sadie, Lennon McCartney, The Beatles, 1968. 12. Murder Old Bruce let Bobby, Mary, and me out of the car and drove away. I looked up at Gary's place. It was a two-story wooden house on the side of a hill, set back off old Topanga Canyon Road. Because of the hillside, the first floor living quarters seemed to be on the second story, with a long row of stairs leading up to it. The three of us began to climb the stairs, and I was scared. The summer sky seemed very blue, and the hills were magnificent as my eyes swept across the landscape. Sadness mingled with my fear. I was heavy and sad late that July day in 1969. Bobby seemed nervous, but his natural arrogance compensated for it, and he was as cocky and confident as ever. I thought of his competitiveness, especially with Charlie. He was gripped with the need to prove that he could do anything Charlie could do. He seemed to need to prove it to himself, to Charlie, and to all of us. I knew he would kill to prove it. Mary was quiet and brooding. I can only surmise that she felt much as I did, afraid and sad. Gary had helped her retain her baby when authorities had threatened to take him. Bobby knocked on the door. After several seconds, Gary opened it up and grinned broadly at the three of us. I knew he felt more than friendship for Bobby, but he had a genuine friend to all of us. We said hi, almost in concert. Can we come in? Bobby asked. Sure, Gary said. Please do. He led us directly into the kitchen. Sit down, he said, motioning to the chairs around a kitchen table, pushed close to the wall in a little alcove, with just room enough for a chair on each side. Bobby took the place next to the wall. Mary and I were on one side, and Gary sat opposite us, cater corner to Bobby. Small talk continued for a minute or two, and then Bobby looked into Gary's face. We need money, Gary. Would you give us the money you have in the bank and your cars? Gary owned a van and a car. Gary's face clouded, but the smile remained. I don't have any money in the bank or anywhere else, he said. I'll give you all that I have, but it's only 10 or $15. Bobby's face was starkly emotionless, without a hint of a smile. We know you have a lot of money, Gary, he said huskily and barely audibly. Gary stared back into Bobby's eyes for several seconds and moved as though to rise from the table but remained seated. I think you better leave now. Bobby reached quickly under his shirt and pulled out a gun, a twenty two caliber revolver. You don't understand. We want your money. 
Gary stood up, and in a flash, Bobby reached across the table and hit him, flush on the mouth with his fist, knocking him to the floor. Gary spit out a piece of tooth and rose quickly to his feet. Bobby scrambled from behind the table, and they began to fight. Bobby fired the gun once, and the slug splintered the wooden cabinets on the opposite wall. He then handed the gun to me and said to Gary, I'm going to teach you a lesson. They battled furiously, slugging and wrestling and kicking all over the kitchen, down onto the floor, and then up again. Without thinking, I put the gun on the table, and Gary immediately lunged for it, getting it ahead of Bobby as they struggled. Gary broke clear and held the gun on Bobby and Mary and me. We stood absolutely motionless. The only sound was the gasping, desperate breathing of Bobby and Gary. Bobby began cursing me. You dumb bitch, he screamed. Why did you let him get the gun? He blistered me, and I wilted close to tears, but held them back, determined not to let my weakness show. We stood there for several minutes. Gary obviously didn't know what to do. There he was threatened right within his own home. He had no place else to go. His gentleness and sensitivity began to show on his face. He was a pacifist in the truest sense, and clearly had no stomach for the madness of that moment. With tears in his eyes, he handed the gun back to Bobby. I just don't believe in violence, he said. Here, you take the gun. I don't want it. Why don't you just go? Just leave me alone. Bobby took the gun and with it motioned Gary up one step into the living room. Turning to Mary and me, he said, You clean the room up and then fix some coffee. We'll be in here. I could hear Bobby trying to persuade Gary to give him the money. His voice was low and gentle, then harsh and sharp. Gary insisted over and over that he had no money. Finally, he said, I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. He lay on a couch in the living room. Bobby stuck his head into the kitchen and told me to go watch Gary. I'm going to call Charlie, he said. It seemed less than an hour before Charlie arrived, accompanied by old Bruce. Gary was awake. He began yelling at Charlie, I thought you were my friend. Charlie had a 20-inch, razor-sharp sword buckled to his waist. I had seen it before at the ranch. He pulled it from its metal scabbard and, without warning, slashed the whole right side of Gary's face from ear to chin. It was a ghastly cut and blood spurted all over the room. Gary screamed and fell back onto the couch, grabbing his slashed right ear. He was in terrible pain. Mary ran to get a towel for him to hold over his face. The blood was spattering everywhere. Mary and I went back into the kitchen and Charlie followed us. I was shaking all over and terrified. Take care of his wounds, Charlie said to both of us. Make him comfortable. Then Charlie and old Bruce abruptly left. I had no idea what was going to happen. I'm sure none of us did. Gary fell onto the floor and went to sleep, holding the towel against his face. He frequently moaned and occasionally deep sobs came from his throat. Throughout that night, Bobby, Mary, and I took speed. One of us always kept close to Gary, while the other two talked and dozed and listened to the radio. Late in the morning the next day, I walked to Topanga Canyon Shopping Center to get supplies. I was in a stupor and hardly remembered coming and going. I ran into some friends from the canyon, I remember, and they all said I looked terrible. Fortunately, they couldn't see inside me. I bought food, bandages, hydrogen peroxide, and dental floss. We had decided to try to sew up Gary's face and ear with dental floss, although this never materialized. 
Back at the house, Mary tended to Gary's wounds, trying to clean them, but infection had already set in. I prepared chicken and rice soup for him and spoon-fed it to him on the floor. Don't talk now, I said. Just eat this so you'll get better. I continued feeding him. He was unable to smile, but his eyes were filled with tenderness and affection. Please give us the money, Gary, I said softly. Then everything will be all right. He didn't say anything, continuing to accept the soup from my hand. He looked directly into my eyes. Sadie, you're an angel. I couldn't take it anymore. I finished giving him the soup and left the room. I was on the verge of vomiting. Several jumbled hours of indecision followed. I don't believe anybody knew what was going to happen next. Bobby, Mary, and I tried to persuade Gary to give us the ownership registration papers for his cars. He wouldn't tell us where they were. Then we asked him again for the money. He persisted with his denials that he had any. Then came more hours of indecision and waiting. Late in the day, the second day, Bobby fell asleep and Gary made an attempt to escape. But Bobby awoke as he neared the, the door and beat him horribly. The second night was long. The three of us slept in shifts and the confusion and desperation deepened. Everything was unreal, surrealistic, in slow motion. The early morning of the third day, we were convinced that Gary had no large sum of money. We figured it was impossible to hold out as long as he had in his condition if he was lying. But we continued to badger him for the car papers. Finally, he told us where they were and, under Bobby's threats, signed them over to him. It was late in the afternoon of the third day. Mary and I were in the kitchen. Bobby walked in and said quietly, You two stay in here. I'm going to have to kill him. I stood facing away from the living room. I knew Mary was in the kitchen, but I felt alone. Alone and cold. I shivered. From the living room, I heard Gary's voice. No, Bobby, my God! I couldn't stop myself. I ran into the room. Gary was standing, holding his stomach, and Bobby clutched a knife. Gary lurched toward the bathroom off the li living room. He stayed only a few seconds and came back into the room. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Gary was obviously mortally wounded, but we were all standing or moving around. Reality had vanished. A dark brown color had settled over everything. We all seemed transparent. Gary eased himself down onto the floor and lay on his side with his legs pulled up, still holding his stomach, moaning and sobbing. Bobby went to him and stabbed him again. Turning to us abruptly, with absolute blankness in his eyes, he swept his arm across the room. Get a sponge and go through and wipe everything clean, he said. Don't miss anything. I looked out of the corner of my eye at Gary. He was dying. Mary and I did as we had been told and then began packing everything we had brought. Food, first aid supplies, into a big brown paper bag. Suddenly we were more moving quickly, scrambling. The slow motion had turned to double time, like an old Charlie Chaplin movie. We decided on a plan to throw confusion into any police investigation by making the murder look like the work of revolutionaries. Bobby used a glove to write political piggy in Gary's blood on a wall of the living room. Then we checked everything over one last time and went out the door, locking it from the inside. As we turned to start down the steps, we heard a noise from inside. It was Gary. He was still clinging to life. We can't leave him like that, Bobby said. The panic in his voice clutched at my throat. He then went to a side window that had been left unlocked and went back into the house. 
He was inside several minutes, and the hysteria grew. Mary appeared to be near to collapsing. I feared I might begin screaming. Bobby stepped back onto the small porch. I had to smother him with a pillow. We took one of Gary's cars and drove away in silence. Bobby said he'd return for the other one. It struck me that that didn't make sense. We should have taken both cars or left both of them, but they were in Bobby's name then. Chaos overpowered any irrational thinking and we sped away. Hmm. In Chatsworth, we stopped at a small restaurant where we removed all clothing that showed blood stains and dumped it in a large outside trash receptacle along with the supplies we had taken. Then, fighting desperately to control ourselves, we went into the restaurant and ordered coffee and pie. Bobby's eyes were steel blue once again as he turned to me midway through the pie and said flatly, I should have killed you too, Sadie, for letting him get the gun. It was nighttime when we arrived back at Spawn's ranch. I went immediately to the back ranch house where everyone seemed to be asleep. I crawled in alongside Ella and Sandra, whispering to Ella as I laid my head on the pillow, Gary is dead. The next morning, Ella and her man, Bill, disappeared, taking a truck and some camping equipment. Things had apparently got too far out of hand for them. They were not the only ones to leave during those crazy days. We had grown to about 25 steady people, a core or inner group of 15, and many were not prepared for the sort of violence that was unfolding. Even a handful from the core group decided to leave. Through all this uncertainty, Charlie continued to use his girls to attract male followers. He made extra efforts, some successful, to attract motorcycle gang members. They were free and tough, and Charlie both admired and feared them. But not many wanted any part in what we seemed to be driven to. We took Gary's van way out back at the ranch so it wouldn't be seen. But Bobby felt it was not good for him to hang around spawns, so taking Gary's other car, he left to let things cool down. I was scared to death at this time. Mary and I decided we should stay in hiding during the daytime and only move around and mix with the others during the night. I was beset with the fear that I would tell everything if I was called by the police. All of us were thoroughly programmed not to talk if caught, but I had an overwhelming tendency to blurt things out under pressure. Even then, I knew the cause of this weak weakness. Part of it was fear and part was pride. The desire to prove myself to be something special, a big shot. Throughout all those days, I was concerned, consumed more than ever with the dis desire to belong. I was becoming more and more possessed with the fear that I was not accepted. In fact, however, it seemed that the others saw me as strong and tough. When the others were practicing with the guns we were acquiring, for instance, Charlie said I didn't need to practice. You're strong enough to take care of yourself, he said. Despite my huge fears and weaknesses, I was being perceived as strong because of a power within me that was not mine. Charlie recognized this power, and even though I was sure he didn't really like me, he admired this strength because it was just like his. Over and over he told me, You have power, Sadie. You're strong, tough. You're a leader. You know what to do. But he only told me this when we were alone. In front of others, he degraded me. I know now that his motive was to lift the others up by putting me, a strong one, down. He played yo-yo with all of us. During this period of chaos and confusion, especially after Gary's death, we underwent hours and hours, nights and nights, of a lecturing and indoctrination by Charlie. He was more intense than I had ever seen him. Helter Skelter is coming down faster and faster. The veins stood out on his neck as he declared this time after time. We must survive. We have to kill 
or be killed. And he smoke, spoke repeatedly about the need to escape to the desert. Those people out there in the world, they are so busy running for the almighty dollar, they don't have time to just sit and be with themselves to get in tune with the one. They are like robots programmed to work those eight hours a day, all caught up in their little worlds, like living in little boxes, waiting to die. Every one of them racing along those freeways to their doom. Even if they could stop and take a look at themselves, they wouldn't be able to accept what they see because of the guilt they carry around. They eat cows and animals and tear down trees and all the things this planet gives us and don't put nothing back into it. Selfish and greedy robots. With their bombs, they think they're going to blow it up one day. Not as long as I'm around. They'll never blow it up. They'll never blow it up. He stopped and then broke into one of his songs and we picked up the chant with him. Garbage dump, my garbage dump. The world is my garbage dump. The world is my garbage dump. Garbage dump, oh garbage dump. That sums it up in one big lump. You could feed the world with my garbage dump. You could feed the world with my garbage dump. That sums it up in one big lump. We all laughed and passed joints around. That seemed to be the only way we can get a handle on what Charlie was telling us. <clears throat> but before our attention wandered, he took the floor once again and pressed on with his monologue. Guilt. Look at guilt. What is guilt anyway? It is just something mommy and daddy put in you to control you, to do what they wanted you to do. <clears throat> if you didn't do what they said, you felt guilty about it. Well, listen, I've told you this over and over right from the beginning. There is no such thing as guilt. You don't got to do what mommy and daddy say to do anymore. You are your own person and you just do what you want to do. Do what you do and don't think about it. There is no guilt. He shouted it. Guilt is all in your head. It is an illusion. It isn't real. Everything you see is an illusion, a figment of your imagination. You create the world you live in. You are what you see. Get outside yourself and look back at yourself and you will see that even you are an illusion. There is only one and we are all part of that one. I watched Charlie carefully. We all did, hanging on his every word. But does it make sense? I asked myself, taking a choke on a joint. Sometimes it doesn't seem to make sense. But then I laughed. Charlie had the answer for that too. He was forever saying, No sense makes sense. On August 6th, a couple of days after Bobby had left, we received word that he had been arrested and was in the Los Angeles County Jail. His knife had been found in the trunk of Gary's car that he was driving. Instantly, the atmosphere at Spawn's tightened even more. We figured it would only be hours before the police came down on us. But additionally, we were all affected by Charlie's obsession with getting Bobby out of jail. Bobby had been driven by a need to prove himself as tough as Charlie, and now Charlie was possessed with the need to prove his loyalty to his brother, to die for him if necessary. He's our brother, Charlie almost shouted to a small gathering of the core group. Our enemy has him in its territory, and we have to get him out. I had never seen him more determined. His eyes seemed to burn. I, meanwhile, sensed doom. I felt a great cloud, a huge gray blanket, beginning to fall over me. But Charlie's loyalty touched a similar spark in me, and I forced myself to join in the round-the-clock sessions to find a way to free Bobby. 
Out of all the confusion and the mass of words, the constant use of drugs came a vague sort of scheme to convince the police that Bobby could not have done the Hinman killing. It was a plan for copycat murders that would make the police believe that they had the wrong man in jail, since similar revolutionary killings were still taking place while Bobby was behind bars. In our crazed condition, we convinced ourselves that the police would be forced to release our brother and we would meet in the desert to begin new lives from the world and its problems. Vincent Bugliosi, the prosecutor, later totally rejected this theory and remained convinced that the Manson family had had a wild and massive plot to bring about Armageddon and flee to the bottomless pit in the desert, from where Charles Manson, sometimes thought of as Jesus Christ, would one day be su summoned to lead the world. It is entirely possible that some in our group, perhaps including Charlie himself, had in our satanic state slipped into such ideas. But to the best of my understanding, the copycat plan was the primary motive behind the most horrible rampage of killing and human destruction in California history. The Tate-LaBianca Murders